The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a search for truth. I did everything I could do to try and find truth. At the business end of a barrel. I was in my dorm room and had a gun to my head. What drove the singer to the brink of suicide? And I just broke. Plus, stir up trouble. Pastor Tim Ross shares why Christians should be doing just that on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Attorney General Barr under fire as congressional Democrats grilled him for nearly five hours. Their accusations, quote, aiding and abetting the president and violating his oath of office. And for the first time in the history of the United States is one political party now in opposition to law and order in favor of terrorism. Here's Charlene Aaron. Attorney General Barr spent nearly five contentious hours before the House Judiciary Committee. Democratic Chairman Jerry Nadler set the tone right out of the gate. In your time at the department, you have aided and abetted the worst failings of the president. Barr firing back that he's not doing the president's bidding. I'm supposedly uh, punishing the president's enemies and helping his friends. What enemies have I indicted? Who, who, could you point to one indictment that has been under the department that you feel is, is unmerited? Others directly accusing him of violating his oath. There's nothing more dangerous to our republic than an attorney general who refuses to uphold his oath, refuses to uphold and defend the Constitution, and swears allegiance to just one person, Donald Trump. Now, I, Sadly, that's where we are today. My loyalty is uh, the Mr. Constitution. Chairman, I back. That's why I, I came into government. General lady yields The back. lady just accused him General, of not adhering to his General oath of office. General Let him lady. talk. Republican Jim Jordan, the ranking minority member, said the Democrats' hostility is all about one thing, Barr's investigation of the Russia probe and his one-word description of the Obama administration's actions. Spying, that one word, that's why they're after you, Mr. Attorney General. Fifteen months ago, April 10th, 2019, in a Senate hearing, you said this sentence, quote, I think spying on a political campaign is a big deal. And since that day, since that day, when you had the courage to state the truth, they attack you. They've been attacking you every since, every day, every week, for simply stating the truth that the Obama-Biden administration <laughs> spied on the Trump campaign. The attorney general made news at the hearing, yeah. revealing a separate investigation is underway in the unmasking of General Michael Flynn and others in surveillance reports by members of the Obama administration. I've asked another U.S. attorney to look into the issue of unmasking because of you know, the high number of unmaskings and some that do not readily appear to have been um, in the line of normal business. Wait a minute, so I want to be clear. So there is a there is another investigation on that issue specifically going on at the Justice Department right now? Yes. He also said peaceful protests in the wake of the killing of George Floyd have been hijacked by violent rioters and anarchists. And he defended sending federal agents to Portland and other cities. What unfolds nightly around the courthouse cannot reasonably be called protest. It is by any objective measure an assault on the government of the United States. The Mueller report and voter fraud also came up in the hearings. In fact, one Republican lawmaker said Barr was blamed for so much, he surprised Democrats didn't try to pin the COVID-19 pandemic on him. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, CBN Chief Political Analyst David Brody is going to join us now. And David, could you tell me what is going on with this Nadler investigation? I, I don't even know where to begin, uh, Pat. Uh, you've got the hearing. Uh, you've got the, 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 the Durham investigation. Uh, look, let, let's just start with this. Uh, it was not the House Judiciary Committee yesterday. It was the House Grandstanding Committee. It was a bunch of Democrats uh, grandstanding and basically getting all of their frustration out uh, aimed at the president through Bill Barr. Uh, and that's what we saw. Uh, look, you know, what's interesting, Pat, on all of this is that Bill Barr at one point during the hearing said, hey, I thought this was a hearing and that means I'm supposed to be heard. And he couldn't even be heard. 
I mean, at one point, Jerry Nadler, the, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, actually said, uh, well, actually, Barr asked for a five minute break. And Jerry Nadler said, no, you, you can't have a five minute break for lunch. Uh, the whole thing was was unraveling. But but Jim Jordan pegged it correctly. Uh, this is all about the fact that Bill Barr is looking into spying, the spying that the Obama Biden administration did on the Trump campaign. And that's why Democrats have to stop Barr now to discredit him before some of this information comes out, which we believe is going to come out sometime before the November election. It feels like an October surprise to me, Pat. Uh, David, let me ask you this. Um, I don't believe in the history of America we've ever had a time where one political party actually supported uh, domestic terrorism, supported violence, and supported uh, actions against the police. Uh, is this unusual in our uh, democracy? No, it's unprecedented. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, Bill Barr actually said in that hearing yesterday to Democrats, he said, hey, can, can we get anybody, anybody on your side of the ledger to say something about violence against federal courthouses in America, which is what we've been seeing now for 62 straight nights uh, uh, in Portland. Uh, and so you're right, Pat. Look, Pat, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. The last time, if you just do a quick uh, control F, right, control find in the Constitution, you search assemble, you see the words peacefully assemble. You don't see the words violently assemble. And, and I think the, the problem here, and the media has uh, practiced journalistic malpractice here uh, to the nth degree, along with the Democrats, who are basically calling all of these rioters and anarchists uh, peaceful protesters, they're, or they're just calling them protesters. The problem is they're not. There are three groups, right? I mean, you've got the peaceful protesters that are there for the day uh, into the early evening. Then the anarchists come out at night. And remember, uh, you know, you've got, you've got that situation going on. And then you have the federal agents that have, uh, you know, to a degree have exacerbated the whole situation. So that's what's going on. The problem is, is that what the media is doing is they're conflating the two. If there are some peaceful protesters in with the anarchists, all of a sudden, everybody's a protester. Not true at all. And we know is something about an apple and the bunch. Uh, one bad anarchist ruins the whole bunch. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening here, Pat. Uh, well, David, uh, Joe Biden also announced a, my, a, major, a minority economic plan. He said he'll announce a vice president next week. What do you what, what do you think is going to be the pick? Do you have any idea? Well, I think it's between two. It's between Kamala Harris uh, and uh, Susan Rice. Uh, those are the two what I believe are going to be finalists here. Uh, I personally believe, go ahead and uh, cue this tape up, Pat, if I'm right. If I'm, if I'm wrong, you can bury it somewhere in the archives. Uh, but I think it's going to be Susan Rice. Uh, look, because wh why exactly? Because this is a very important vice presidential pick. Normally, it doesn't really matter too much. This time around, it's different. Joe Biden will be 81 if he won. A, uh, if he won, he would be 81 going into a second term. He's not going to run for a second term. We pretty much know that, which means the folks that are voting this time around uh, for Joe Biden are, in essence, voting for the vice president to be the presidential nominee uh, going forward. And so Susan Rice, the former national security advisor, the former U.N. ambassador to the United Nations. I mean, look, she is someone uh, that. Joe Biden believes could step in on day one and be president of the United States. There is no learning curve there. She's been around the action. Uh, having said that, she's got a controversial and sordid past to a degree. If you talk to conservatives when it comes to the unmasking of General Flynn and everything going on with uh, Spygate, well, David, as, as the Trump administration calls it. David, as I recall the Benghazi hearings, there was rioting against our uh, facility in Benghazi and Susan Rice went on television to say the reason was not because of some Muslim riot, but because of a uh, tract that had been published uh, a few days before, which was just nonsense. I mean, she lied through her teeth. Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. No, you're 100 percent right. You have the facts correct. And that is another uh, notch in the conservative attack machine that will go against Susan Rice if she's the one picked. I think he's going to pick her just because uh, she's ready uh, to be president in his mind. And he needs someone uh, that will have a very short learning curve. Kamala Harris, I will say, is potentially the other pick here. She could actually get it as well. And we even saw some notes that he had prepared 
when he had talked to reporters yesterday, uh, she was on those notes. So that may give us an indication that she's uh, definitely in the running it here in the end. Okay. Well, David, thank you. Uh, the, the problem with uh, Kamala Harris, apparently she attacked him during those debates. And it's a question as whether he will forgive and forget. But uh, uh, Susan Rice, in my opinion, is an absolute disaster. And uh, she worked a long time ago when I was involved with things in Africa. She was the advisor on Africa. And she was, in my opinion, an absolute disaster. So to see her as a potential next president should give uh, fright and, uh, and pause and, you know, night sweats to anybody who contemplates it. Well, in other news, the dollar is taking a deep dive while gold is hitting record highs. And what does this pose, and why does this pose a risk for our economy? John Jessup has more. That is right, Pat. The two are moving in opposite directions. The dollar has been falling since it peaked in March. The dollar index has dropped 10% since then, with a sharp plunge this month set to be the worst in over nine years. Meanwhile, gold is hitting new record highs, closing in on another major milestone, $2,000. Now, Wall Street's Goldman Sachs warns the rising price of gold and other concerns could pose long-term problems for the dollar. They write, combined with a record level of debt accumulation by the U.S. government, real concerns around the longevity of the dollar as a reserve currency have started to emerge. The dollar has been the world's primary currency, Pat, of course, you know, since the end of World War II. Yeah, uh, John, I've been talking about this for some time. When you're the reserve currency, it means that everybody has to take the dollar. So the Federal Reserve can print all the dollars it wants to, and everybody's got to take them because that is a reserve currency. So a number of the other countries are saying, look, you're inflating your dollar all to pieces, and we think there should be a basket of, uh, uh, well, of precious metals such as gold. And so a lot of central banks are buying gold, and the price of gold has gone up. You remember it was at one time $250 an ounce, now it's, it's crowding in on $2,000, and it could go to three, four, five thousand 5,000 an ounce. And uh, the price of silver, the silver is next to gold. It's been actually uh, uh, oversold, but silver is a commodity that has some value. Gold is just, there it is. I mean, it's one of those things that there are only so many ounces of it in the world. But uh, uh, for smart investors to put some money into gold and silver, and there's some uh, yours truly has been the last few days uh, trying to get some of that in the portfolio because I think it's very important. Uh, but you've always had gold. Huh? You've always had gold. I've always had it, but I've got, I've got more of it recently. <laughs> okay, good advice. Good, okay. good to know. Uh, John, what, are you, what else you got? All right, Pat, turning to COVID-19 and progress on those vaccines we've been reporting on, HHS Secretary Alex Azar says there could be tens of millions of doses of a vaccine this year. And there's more good news from drug maker Moderna. Tests showing seven out of eight primates who received the vaccine showed no trace of the virus in their lungs just two days after exposure. This as the Coronavirus Task Force has identified 21 states as hot zones, calling on them to put in place greater restrictions. We are still seeing significant outbreaks occurring from birthday parties, graduation parties, um, family reunions. It wasn't just me being an outliner. Dr. Birx was saying the same thing, that one is universal wearing of masks, avoid crowds, close the bars. The president announced Tuesday that the Eastman Kodak Company is switching gears to help increase domestic drug production. The camera and technology company winning a $765 million government loan to make ingredients used in a number of generic drugs. Well, social media companies are targeting posts about the effectiveness of the drug hydroxychloroquine in treating COVID-19. Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook all taking down a video with doctors testifying to the drug's success in treating patients. American frontline doctors made the video at a summit hosted by Tea Party Patriots in Washington this week. The video, retweeted by President Trump, was seen millions of times across social media before Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter took action to remove it. When the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., tweeted a clip, 
Twitter deleted the video temp and temporarily suspended his account for, quote, spreading misleading and potentially harmful information related to COVID-19. President Trump, who has taken the drug and touted its effectiveness, is accusing social media companies of censorship for political reasons. While the FDA has rescinded its approval for emergency use of the drug, a recent study by a doctor from Yale University's Public School of Health, Pat, found hydroxychloroquine highly effective as an early treatment, especially when combined with specific anti antibiotics and zinc. Well, antibiotics and zinc, but in terms of uh, defense against COVID, it's highly unlikely. You know, I really believe the president would do himself a tremendous favor if he just stayed out of this. He is the chief executive, not the chief medical officer of the United States. And I think he just lays himself open to criticism. And uh, I think the issue that he should drill on every single day. Stay on the message, Mr. President. The message is violence and anarchy taking over our cities. And the Antifa and Black Lives Matter and other organizations are hijacking so-called peaceful protests. And the answer that the people are looking for in America is, will you keep us safe from violence? Will you protect us against overseas in aggression? And if he stays on those themes, he will be victorious. But he gets off on these sidetracks, like telling people to take hydroxychloroquine. That's not his business. You know, however intelligent it may be, Mr. President, believe it from those who just love you, stay on message. You've only got a few more weeks before the election. Stay on message, John. Pat, so many of the nation's senior citizens are in a state of permanent quarantine. And studies show that's bad for their health since loneliness increases the risk of dying by 70%. Now one senior living community is using technology to allow residents to interact with those on the outside and share their wisdom with the next generation. Mark Martin has more. We've seen how this pandemic put a damper on family celebrations from birthdays to marriages, to senior class milestones like proms and graduation ceremonies. To help lift up members of the class of 2020, residents at the senior living community, Westminster Canterbury on Chesapeake Bay, reached out with advice and lessons learned from the past. You are there to learn. Go to every class. I never cut a class while I was in college. Resident and former teacher Neola Waller chatted with Cox High School senior Alexandria Pisano as part of the program Seniors Celebrating Seniors. By using a birdsong tablet, the video communication tool developed by Westminster Canterbury, the residents safely spoke with the graduating seniors. What kind of advice did you give her? Well, having taught seniors for 30 years, I have lots of advice, and uh, your time is too short for me to tell it all. But I had some items. For one, I said, uh, just remember when you go to college, you will be learning something, and your parents will expect you to graduate with a marketable skill. Pisano plans to attend Old Dominion University to major in neonatal nursing. She describes Waller, who's 91 years young, as an amazing woman. As a first-generation college student, it was really hard to kind of like figure out what I was expecting to get into. So her adopting me really made me kind of like get inspiration on like what to expect and what to how to pursue my career. She gave me really great advice. And Pisano says what made her relationship with Waller even more special was the fact that Waller taught at Cox High School for 30 years. I still keep in touch with a lot of my students. It was just amazing to speak to her. And I, we had a great relationship. And honestly, I feel like we're going to have a forever relationship. Like, I'm going to come back from school and, like, visit her just to talk to her about advice on what I should do in school because I know I'm going to be lost. She has a wonderful smile, which I think will be very healing and accepting of her patients. I've loved talking with you. I know you gave me such great advice. Mark Martin, CBN News, Virginia Beach. 
Great story. Thanks, Mark. Pat, that's a story that will put a smile on your face. It should. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't that great? You know, the Bible says, rise up before the gray hair. But I, I do think that we have been so much oriented toward the youth culture that the old people have sort of been relegated. Now, you're an old fossil. Get off the <laughs> stage. Let us take over. But I think to look at the age of those who've got wisdom and for these young kids in high school to to look to these uh, seniors for advice is beautiful. And I commend Westminster Canterbury, which is an extraordinary uh, nursing facility and, and senior citizen facility. And they, they, by the way, got ahead of this corona thing. They had a complete lockdown. They let nobody visit anybody. I don't care what the relationship was. And not one single case of COVID took place in that nursing home. And you look at the governor of New York, and he's being condemned because what he did, he took sick people and put them into nursing homes. And the next thing you know, the, the spread was virulent, so and dozens and dozens of people died. As one uh, doctor uh, who happened to be a senator from Kentucky said, uh, that governor should have been impeached because of what he did. But by putting those uh, sick people into nursing homes and because he was afraid the hospitals were too full, uh, he uh, caused the death of a whole lot of people. But Westminster Canterbury set the stage. They wouldn't let one single person, I don't care what the relationship or anybody, nobody came into that facility. And as a result, not one single case of COVID. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Wow, I love it. It's a great facility. Okay. All righty. Well, still ahead, a backup singer for Katy Perry and an American Idol alum. What drove this worship leader to the brink of suicide and what stopped her? Tasha Layton shares her story coming up. Plus, your questions and Pat's honest answers. A viewer wants to know, I've read that the unbelieving spouse is saved by the believing spouse. So does my husband get a free ride into heaven? <laughs> Stay tuned for Pat's answer on that and much more right after this. Tasha Layton was on a search for truth. Where did, where did it take her? To Buddhist camps, Islamic mosques, and New Age schools. So when did her search nearly come to an end? The night that Tasha put a loaded gun to her head. Can you make something from the wreckage? I'm Tasha Layton. Would you take this heart and Well, I grew up in a Christian home. I you know, read my Bible every day. I was super excited to serve God. I went on missions trips and was just really passionate. Then just like a lot of people experienced some some pretty severe church hurt. And I, I couldn't reconcile how people could be Christian and yet lie about other people. It was very wounding, especially as a teenager. I just doubted myself. I doubted who I was in Christ. I needed to know that Jesus was who He said He was and who He says He is because I was so hurt. I started to study music in college because I always wanted to serve God in music. But I changed my major from music to religion and I just tried to seek out truth wherever I could find it. I went through this period of searching. And so I went to Buddhist meditation camp. I went to synagogue. I went to mosque. I studied mysticism in Europe for a summer. I did everything I could do to try and find truth. I think what I found with the other religions I studied was that every one of them sort of had a piece of the truth, some peace or some fulfillment, but it was never holistic for me. It was never uh, something that changed my whole being or changed me from the inside out. I think I just felt very alone. And I, I thought, no one understands. No one else understands. When I hit rock bottom was really when I tried to commit suicide. I was in my dorm room and had a gun to my head. A friend walked in that day into my dorm room and saw what was happening and just hugged me and grabbed me and I just broke. In all of these other religions, you had to strive to reach God. You had to be good enough or do all the right things or to reach enlightenment or the divine. 
I realized that in Christianity, Jesus pursued us. He came down to earth. And when I think about the grace of God, He'll always be there. And He prevented, He's the one that walked in that room. And I thought, okay, this is different. I just knew that I wanted to serve God with my spirit, my soul, my mind. I went back to church and felt the Spirit of God again. I felt God's truth move from my head to my heart. That started a trajectory of healing in my life. And I remembered the call of God on me when I was a teenager. And I decided to pursue that again. And I ended up going to seminary in California. And then when I graduated, I was a worship pastor at a church. Some friends of mine were auditioning for American Idol and had asked me if I wanted to do it. And I ended up making it. I was on the same season as Tori Kelly, Lauren Daigle. It was fun. And I left thinking, I feel like maybe I'm supposed to do something like this. And made the transition and ended up singing professionally. That's when I decided to move to Nashville and pursue music and write music for myself. My mind is racing with the question, are you still good? Now I'm putting out music and touring as an artist and a worship leader. I met my husband shortly after I moved. And so we ended up getting married and he's a writer and producer and we have uh, two little ones. We just are loving our little family and enjoying life. Though the mountains may be moved into the sea. The song Into the Sea, It's Gonna Be Okay, it's based on Psalm 46. And there's never been a moment where we've needed to hear that more. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna what I love about the song is that it can speak to individual situations, but it's also speaking to our world. And I think we can relate on a lot of levels. I would say to anyone who is questioning their faith, God's not intimidated by their questions and He is pursuing them. He's already done the work. And so there is grace that comes from that that is more beautiful than anything else on the planet or anything we can experience. Tasha was searching for the truth, and she finally found it. His name is Jesus. And if you are searching today for the truth like Tasha, or maybe even right now you're contemplating suicide, I just want you to stop right now because God loves you. And Tasha found that love. She couldn't find it in any other religion, but she found it in Jesus, in Christianity, because like she said, he paid the price for you and for me. And all we have to do is receive. So if you need someone to pray with right now, we want to make it easy for you. Just give us a call. Just go to your phone right now. Call 1-800-700-7000. Someone is standing by. They want to pray with you. They love you. They're going to tell you some good news. And we all need the good news of Jesus. So call us right now, 1-800-700-7000. All right, we are going right into some email. Still in the email. We're okay, ready this to go. viewer says, Dear Pat, if I am a Christian and I am saved, but my husband is not, will he still be allowed to get into heaven? He curses, says he hates certain people. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even, he never goes to church, has bullied our children while they were growing up, as well as me, with cursing and threats of throwing us out. I've read that the unbelieving spouse is saved by the believing spouse. So does my husband get a free ride? into heaven. Um, I, I think you misread the Bible. It says um, your children are born holy if, if one of you is a Christian. Uh, the mother, especially the female lion, uh, would, you know, that would take care of the children. But uh, it says that your godly conduct as a wife can lead your husband to the Lord, but in no way does it say because you are a Christian, your husband who is an ungodly man is going to get a free ride into heaven. I think you've misread the word. He's going to stand on his loan. Believe me, if he continues the course he's on, uh, he hasn't got heaven in mind. He's got something much, much worse, okay? It's amazing how many people think they can ride the coattails of their grandparents, their parents, yeah, yeah. their spouse, you know. And There's no such thing as, as generational salvation. I mean, if, right. you know, if your father was, was uh, you know, to the Lord, I mean, those things, will, there is 
a generational thing. We call it epigenetics, where uh, the, the godly living of parents will reflect in their children's health and, and, and well, their, their whole uh, endeavor. But if you set an example for your children, your children will follow that example. And that's what we're talking about. All right. Amen. All right. Here's a question from Rose. She says, my parents, both in their 70s, don't believe COVID-19 is as dangerous as everybody says. They just came back from a trip to a busy city. We asked them to stay in their home away from us until four, after 14 days. My parents think we live in fear and we don't believe God has control over the situation. We do believe God has control over all. We just want to be responsible. How can we keep ourselves safe without making them feel offended? Uh, the Bible says, the wise man sees the danger and hides himself. The fool goes on and is punished. We know that this is a dread virus. And if you're exposed to it, it will affect you and do terrible things to you. And if you can stay away from it by wearing a mask and staying out of crowds, then you will be in much better shape. So this, this has nothing to do with faith or anything else. It has to do with wisdom. Do not forsake wisdom, okay? Good advice. All right, yeah. Aisha says, after a human dies, can they turn into a guardian angel? Heavens, no. Why did you ever get an idea like that? You can't turn into an angel. You're, you're you. <laughs> when you die, you're going to be with the Lord or you're going to be apart from the Lord. Uh, but your spirit will live on. You won't, you're not turned into an angel. An angel is a different creature. All right. All right. Cole says, I often hear Christians talk about storming the gates of hell, yet I cannot seem to find anything scriptural that tells us to storm the gates of hell. What is your understanding of this? Well, the, the Bible says that the, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, but gates don't move. <laughs> you know? mm. Gates do not move. So the gates of hell are, are, are subject to assault by the Christians. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. That's what the Bible says. But um, I don't know what else you're talking about. Uh, but that, that's, that's what's there, and it has to do with the faith and the belief and Fervent uh, prayer, perhaps? Well, you're, you're praying and you're storming the gates of hell. You're breaking through for God, and they can't prevail against that. But gates don't move, so that they're not coming against you. <laughs> Your gates are stationary. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Carol writes, um, I know that I'm supposed to tithe 10%. So my question is, how do I do that when I'm struggling to stay afloat? How often am I supposed to tithe? And can I tithe at any church, even if I'm not a member? Uh, several questions. Number one, you give to the place you're blessed. Uh, and you, you can give to God's work in a number of places. There are people that do God's work all over there that, that is legitimate that you can give to. But you don't have to tithe. That is your work between you and the Lord. And I must say that if you want a blessing, it isn't a question of do you have to, but it's what opportunity do you have to give money away because God will take that money and he will put his stamp of approval on it and multiply it 30, 60, and 100 fold. So you want blessing, that's how to get blessing. And there are those who withhold more than is ought, and it tends only to poverty. And there are those who give generously, and it brings forth a great harvest. So it's a question of blessings. So if I were you, I'd look for opportunities. But no, you don't have to give to a church. Uh, if you got a tithe, I mean, there, there's so many worthwhile organizations that are doing God's work. And, and the question is, you know, way back in, in Melchizedek and, and Abraham, El, uh, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, who blessed him. And I think that was the standard in the Old Testament. All right. Well, All right. Thank you so much, Pat. Great you. answers right. and awesome questions. Well, coming up, we want to upset you in a good way. And we want you to upset the world. Why? Pastor and author Tim Ross has the answer, and he joins us live later on today's 700 Club. Also ahead, surgeons cut into her sternum with a saw and 20 years of pain followed. How did this woman finally get relief in an instant? Stay tuned to find out.
Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. New York's vote by mail in its June primary has caused delays in the count and concerns that some of the votes were tossed out. The state has struggled because it collected more than 10 times the usual number of mail-in ballots. Voting ended June 23rd, but the results of several races, including two closely watched congressional primaries, are still unknown. White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany blasted New York's vote counting as a, quote, absolute catastrophe and a reason to question voting by mail in the November elections. Well, four big tech CEOs testify before Congress today, including Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Google. They all agreed to appear to answer questions about their practices from both sides of the aisle. Critics question whether the companies stifle competition and innovation and whether they raise prices for consumers. Many Republicans argue that some big tech platforms censor conservatives online. Big tech has its defenders too, though, saying they've made life and communication easier during the coronavirus outbreak. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more than 700 Club right after this. Keep calm and carry on has become a popular phrase in our culture these days, but it's the opposite of what pastor and author Tim Ross is advocating. He wants you to be upset and he wants you to upset others. Why? Take a look. Tim Ross is the lead pastor of Embassy City Church in Irving, Texas, a multi-ethnic, multi-generational congregation. Pastor Ross points out that in the New Testament, Paul and Silas caused trouble all over the world by sharing the truth of the gospel. He says believers today are to do likewise. Would literally upset the world with the message, hope, and love of Jesus Christ. With a new book, Upset the World, Pastor Ross explains how to do everyday evangelism and change lives in the process. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Tim Ross. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be with you. Tim, why do you want people to be upset and to upset other people? <laughs> well, uh, the premise comes right from Acts chapter number 17, verse number six. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, and now they're here disturbing our city too. The claim that the Jewish people made about Paul and Silas was both exaggerative and prophetic at the same time exaggerative in that Paul and Silas hadn't gone literally all over the world, but prophetic in that they would. And 2,000 years later, we as the disciples of Jesus Christ are still the ones making disciples of all nations and turning people's lives upside down with the message, love, and hope of Jesus Christ. That is a great story. And you just described what the early church did to upset the world. What does it look like today? How can we be upsetters today in our culture? Well, uh, you know, we live in a culture that is very confused right now, very cynical right now. And one of the major things that we can do as believers, what sets us apart is our love for one another and the kindness that we express on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Uh, when you have a, a culture uh, that uh, doesn't trust and you have a culture that is apprehensive of uh, humanity, one of the best things that we can give people is what the love of Jesus looks like in action. And so I'm encouraging everybody as they get this book to learn what it means to be prompted by the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis to look for those opportunities to upset people's world. <laughs> well, you share a very personal upset in your own life that began when you were just eight years old. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, I was sexually abused when I was eight years old by a neighbor that lived across the street from me. At the age of 12, I was exposed to pornography, and by the time I was 19, um, I was a full-blown porn addict. I was highly promiscuous. I was um, uh, low self-esteem, had a lot of low self-worth. All of that was traumatizing, but nothing was more traumatic in my life then January 14th of 1996. And that is the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I know that word trauma has a negative connotation, but seriously, the most upsetting thing that's ever happened to me wasn't the sexual molestation. It wasn't the porn addiction. It was my uh, encounter with Jesus Christ 
and his ability to take a broken life and turn it upside down. Yeah, upsetting in a, like you said, traumatically good way. Um, That's right. And Tim, you also share an example of upsetting the world that occurred when a group was coming to picket your church. What happened? Yeah, so we had a LGBT QIA is all of their letters now, um, group that wanted to come and pick at our church. They uh, realized and identified that uh, our beliefs uh, didn't uh, promote their lifestyle. And there was some apprehension amongst the staff as to what was going to happen when they showed up. And so uh, I took it as a moment to kind of gather our staff and say, hey, God's given us an opportunity here to upset them. They expect our response to be distant. And I think we should draw closer to them. Mm. So uh, we found that it was going to rain that day. So we got uh, extra umbrellas, uh, got some donuts and muffins. <laughs> and uh, we also uh, uh, got a bunch of hugs ready along with some coffee. And we endeavored on that day to not move away from them, but to move close to them, hug them, love on them, give them some food, some hot coffee uh, to continue to protest us and make sure that they were dry by giving them some umbrellas. Upsetting people's world doesn't mean that uh, everything that you do for a person is going to make them agree with you, but it is going to make them walk away with the conclusion that these people are different. So I'm curious, I mean, what happened that day? What was the feedback? How did they respond when you came out with the umbrellas and the donuts and the coffee? Well, this is the best part of the story. They, uh, uh, the rain, it rained so hard, they actually never showed up. Oh. So who, who got upset that day? Well, it was... It was us. It was our staff. God did something in our heart so that we wouldn't uh, be on the defensive when people came on the offensive with us, that we would be open to love in the midst of hate and anger, mm. not retreating away from that. So the people that got upset that day was us. God yeah. was teaching us a lesson. Talk about a countercultural message that we need so badly right now, Tim. That's it. Well, you call your church a picture of heaven on earth. Why is that? Well, uh, we have a very uh, multi-ethnic church. Um, it is uh, the I, I, I always express that I pastor the equivalent of an interracial couple. Uh, so uh, we have blacks and whites and Hispanics and Asians and uh, people that are 13 percent Russian and 72 percent uh, English. And uh, it's it is uh, I don't call it a melting pot because when you melt something, uh, you lose the ability to to, to discern. I call it a salad, right? When you when you think about a salad, you want your lettuce to be lettuce, your tomatoes to be tomatoes. If you're like me, you want your olives to be olives. It is the unique um, individuality amongst this group that makes the salad so good. And we we uh, uh, know that the Holy Spirit is the dressing that makes it all come together. Amen. Well, here's your book, Upset the World. Tim, what do you want people to take away from this? My biggest takeaway that I want people to have from this book, first of all, is that uh, you get upset yourself, that, that you are reminded of the relationship you came into uh, with Jesus and how upsetting of a moment it was for you. Uh, upset, by definition, simply means to turn upside down. And I don't know anybody that's come into a relationship with Jesus Christ that has not had their life turned upside down by his message, his love and his hope. The second thing I want people to walk away with is that we have a mandate to upset others. It's not enough that Jesus came into your life and did it for you. It's now time for you to use your testimony accompanied by his blood to see people's lives upset as well. It's time. It is time. All right. The book is called Upset the World. It's available wherever books are sold. Tim, God bless you. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It was my honor. Well, coming up, open heart surgery saved this woman's life, but it left her in pain for 20 years. What two words finally set her free? The answer after this. Open heart surgery saved Nancy Bradley's life, but it brought her a world of pain. For 20 years, she suffered, but she never lost hope that one day she'd be healed. How did it finally happen when she least expected it? Take a look. 
The doctor said that I would need open heart surgery and that it would be five bypasses. It was 1998 when Nancy Bradley learned that all five major arteries entering her heart were blocked. The news left her and her husband, Omar, reeling. At 7 o'clock, I had the stress test, and by 11 o'clock, I was in surgery. I was shocked that it, it was that serious because she didn't had never slowed down any. She just complained of being short of breath a little bit. The surgery was successful, but recovery was a different story. To access her heart, surgeons had to cut into her sternum using a saw. I was in the hospital for nine days. I came home on the ninth day, and I was really sore. They had me wired together. As weeks, months, and years passed, the pain persisted. It should have gone away, but some people never recover from that because that's a sensitive part of the body. I had a huge sensitivity in the sternal area. I couldn't pick up anything, and if I squeezed something, it centered right into the sternal area and caused it to hurt, just ache. Sometimes when I would just move or bend down, it would, it would aggravate it. The pain continued for 20 years. With flare-ups so agonizing, Nancy often turned to the Lord asking for relief. I'd say, God, I give it to you. I give it to you. I need your touch. I need your help. And you know, Lord, I'm trusting for this to leave in the name of Jesus. Through the years, Nancy and Omar have found encouragement watching The 700 Club. When I listen to The 700 Club, one of the greatest things that they do is when they have a word of knowledge, when they pray for someone, or when they bless somebody in some way. That, that to me is so encouraging, so helpful. Then in July 2019, while watching The 700 Club, Nancy heard a word that was not only encouraging, but life-changing. Gordon had a word of knowledge. There's someone that had had open heart surgery, and they were having problem in the sternal area. There's someone you're, you've had recurring pain in your sternum from open heart surgery, and it just never seems to go away, and you're not even asking for relief. But God sees your pain right now, and he's saying, be healed, and that entire bone be restored now. Cause no more pain, no more discomfort in Jesus' name. Be healed and be set free. I kind of jumped out of my chair, and I said, that's me. I know it's me. God did something for me. I know God did something for me. And I said, is it, is it bothering you now? And she said, no, it's not hard. I don't hardly feel it. By the grace of God, the pain is gone. I do not have the pain. And I am so grateful for what he did because I can lift now and I am free. Freedom from decades of pain has given Nancy a newfound sense of living. She exercises and walks more and she continues to live a life that testifies of God's healing power and love. I try to live for him every day and ask for his blessing, that I would be a blessing to others because he's such a blessing to me. And I'm so grateful. God sent his word and he healed Nancy and he wants to heal you today too, whatever your need is. And we're gonna pray for you in just a moment. But first, we've got some praise reports, Pat. Yeah, let's go, go ahead. Okay, Rick uh, writes, on July 6th, Pat prayed for someone with a crushed shoulder. Five years ago, I suffered a bad fall, landed on my shoulder and my doctor used the word crushed. He repaired it with screws and a plate but said the repair probably wouldn't last more than four or five years. My shoulder repair had been coming apart over the last year, causing pain and limited use. I just happened to catch your show and Pat's healing prayer. Someone I knew, somehow I knew it was for me. During the next week, it was amazing. I have almost no pain and 90% use of my shoulder is back. Thank you, Lord. It has helped me find who I am in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Love it. Uh, here's one right now from Cassandra. You don't know Cassandra, do you? No, don't know anybody by that name. Well, all right. Name. On June 20th, uh, June of this year, actually, I prayed that God would heal a condition of hypothyroidism. Mm. I'd struggled with it for years. I was watching the program, and we were praying, and Wendy had this word, someone has a low thyroid condition for a while. God is healing it. After reviewing my lab results, the doctor said, your thyroid is good, no problem. She said, I am healed. Praise God. Isn't That's that a great? miracle. I love All it. Right. Well, we're going to join yes. in. Let's pray. Thank Folks, you, Lord. 
Nothing's impossible with God. Now, right now, I want you to pray with us. Wendy and I are going to pray for you, and we're going to believe God. Father, thank you for these marvelous words of healing. We know you're powerful, Lord. We know nothing is impossible with you. You created this earth. You put man and woman on this earth, and you can know how to fix their bodies. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Yes. Thank you, Father. Wendy, you, what there's, do you have? Yeah, there's someone you've um, lost your job, and you just lost a relationship you were in, and you're actually thinking of taking your own life, and God is saying to you, daughter, I have more for you, and I love you, and that, that will be the biggest mistake you would ever make. Trust me, there are better days coming, and I'm sending help now in Jesus' name. Just start praising God because He's sending help. Thank you, God. There's a woman, I believe the name is Marcia. You've got a problem right in the center of your, of your being, uh, and you just touch your hand on that, and God is healing it right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. There's someone with just crippling arthritis in several parts of your body and your hands and your feet, and it's, it's really difficult to get around. You can hardly get anywhere uh, without someone helping you, but God is touching you right now, and that arthritis is leaving in Jesus' name. You're going to have mobility again in Jesus' name. Uh, th there's a, a neck condition. Reach up and, and touch your neck in the name of Jesus. There little nodules there that are just going away right now. Jesus, touch. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of James. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. So for Wendy and all of us, this is uh, Pat Robertson. Tomorrow, we've got Jeremiah Johnson. Message. You all want a message. See you later. <laughs>